Good evening, Booktopians, and welcome to another Booktopia TV Live. My name is Mark Harding, and tonight I have the great privilege of being joined by Dr. Julia Baird, author of the best-selling Phosphorescence. Hello. Great welcome, to meet you. Welcome to our Facebook page. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so just a quick shout out to everybody who's tuning in in the audience. This is also an opportunity for you guys to jump in and ask Julia any questions that you might have about phosphorescence. Um, just drop them in the comments below and we will endeavor to get to as many of them as we can uh, at the end of our chat. All right, so my first question. Phosphorescence was published prior to the COVID crisis hitting and then became almost the perfect book for, for last year. What was your sense of the prescience of what you had written as 2020 was unfolding? It really did not, it took a little while to dawn on me, to be, to be honest, because I, I, I had written it as like, this is something I really just had to write. And maybe it will be for like a small group of people if there's like any case of emergency break glass situation. And I didn't really expect there to be kind of a mass situation like that. And I just, I just remember being on the precipice of launching it and I, I, I was down in Hobart reporting and um, with the drum and I remember being on the phone to um, my publisher, to Catherine and to Alice at HarperCollins just, and we're like, we have to cancel the launch, we have to cancel the tour, we have to, and I was like, postpone, postpone, can we just postpone everything? Because at that point, you know, it was like, ha, this could just be weeks, right? This whole <laughs> pandemic thing or maybe months. And then... I just started to get all these emails and all this kind of feedback from people that was astonishing. And it was only really once I was sitting there wading through those notes that I began to realise that people were feeling very isolated and very uncertain and that there was something in that. Because I think I'd written my, the book myself when I was isolated and uncertain very much, um, that there was something there's, there's so many different thoughts in the book, but there was something in there. There was some impulse to try to work out, like, what are the what are the bobbing bits of wood I can hold on to in the spume, you know, like when the ocean's wild, what is it that can keep me afloat? And that that's kind of when I realised that um, some people had found it very timely. So, yeah. So what about for yourself personally through 2020? It was a, a tough year for everyone. Um, how did you cope? Um me personally um i was working very hard um uh, we were still putting out the show but we suddenly had massive shows because it looked like every night it was like wait we've got a whole new industrial relations system wait we've got a whole new like private health system we've got so we were working seven days a week and around the clock to try to get that story right and a lot of our coverage was um really concerned for people that were going to fall through the cracks. We were very concerned about, you know, the vulnerable, people in aged care, people with disabilities, um, the people that were suffering domestic violence. And so I was const we were constantly on tiptoes just trying to put our feelers out to work out what was happening with people and what were the stories that needed to be told that wouldn't be told. And um, so, so, so I was very much absorbed with that. Personally, I, there was a long period of time I couldn't see my mother. I could FaceTime her. Um, and then when I went back in, I was in that one of those, I was almost a hazmat suit, you know, like and you have a visor and then you have a mask and that weird thing of not being able to hug her or like rub her feet because she gets really sore feet. Um, that, that, yeah, I really, really missed her over that time um, and I worried about her being lonely. So, but... Personally, I've made sure, it's weird because I was getting so much of last year was preoccupied with people talking to me about the book. I really made myself get out and, and try to pursue awe and pursue wonder. And I really saw and heard some incredible things. I would drag my kids out when there was massive surf. Um, there's it, it, there's a, When the storms are big, there's a huge um, break, which is off the headland here, called Dead Man's. And um, Kelly Slater was there one day and we would just run there and sit on the cliffs and watch it and it was just so spectacular and amazing and I um, heard whales singing one day when a friend of mine texted wow. me and was like, he's on the other headland at um, Tamarama and he's like, I just saw whales going past and he's a marine biologist. He's like, go out, go to the reef, try to go down about 10 metres and you'll hear them. And I, did, I just ran straight down in my wetsuit. You know, so um, another, and a, up a terrible, like, dragged my friend out swimming one afternoon and we saw 
dolphin. So those things really, really um, kind of got me through in a weird way too. I just am being very deliberate now about stitching them to my days. Yeah. Mm. Um, were you surprised by how much phosphorescence actually did resonate with people? Um, and were there specific parts of the book that you were surprised stood out to people? Yeah, I was surprised. Um, I think because it was so personal and kind of idiosyncratic. And um, like, like some of my stories are like, you know, like when you talk about when you're taking on the Anglican church, right, that is not the story of, say, millions of people. <laughs> So when um, people write to me about that or, or that kind of struck a chord, I both felt initially kind of a bit shy about it actually um, and and then I was fascinated to see what, what, what it was that people had identified with. A lot, I mean, we're in Australia, like a lot of people talking about the swim, a lot of people that I do ocean swimming, which is really what got me thinking about awe. And a lot of people took up ocean swimming during um, during COVID and, again, writing about, like, what is it? What is it about it? It's like this magic thing, like, or, or cold water swimming or whatever their way of finding awe was. I think that we don't talk about it or think about it or definitely don't um, encourage ourselves and each other to pursue it like hunt it and I think that's a really big shift like um how Rachel Carson says that um she wrote this essay in 1956 about how you can before she wrote the silent spring which you know kicked off the modern environmental movement and she she talked about how for children should be taught wonder and she said if I had one if I could be a fairy godmother I would wish that every child would be endowed with an indestructible sense of wonder that will last throughout their lives and not be they wouldn't be distracted by you know like all kinds of other things that are constantly pulling on a distraction are pulling in our attention and she says because we'll be alienated from the sources of our strength and I was like, that is exactly right. We often think of, oh, that's a pretty sunset. Oh, I quite like going for a swim or a walk or, like, I like pottering around the garden and watching watching the bees or watching whatever. We don't actually think this, is, this makes me strong. So it's not like, oh, you're going through a hard time. Why don't you go and, um, you know, look at a pretty picture or get get some snails to, um, you know, get by, get yourself a little aquarium in your house or something. It is work out at times like this we all need our strength so much work out what it is that makes you strong so there was that the other thing that um really connected with people i was interested in um the, my chapter on faith and how do you maintain a faith or reaching towards that which is good and kind and um uh without well, at the same time that you're kind of alienated from many of the behaviours of the church and the language of the church. And I think there's a lot of people who um, feel that way that don't actually have a place to necessarily talk about it mm -hmm. or feel back-footed about it. Um, so, yeah, I think a couple of those, I think those things. But other people, it, it, like it's very, it's very idiosyncratic what people were responding to. I was happy people responded to one line which was about the dawn in Australia not being like Oscar Wilde saying, you know, he said it was like a the dawn creeping along the street like a girl in silver sandaled feet. And and I kind of quoted that and said, no, but in Australia the dawn's like an arsonist that pours mm -hmm. petrol along the horizon and sets it on fire and watches it burn. And because um, I had just been dealing with one of my overseas editors who was like, I don't like that line, just why don't you cut it out? And I was like, I, and, and literally I was walking down to the beach and someone got off his bike to tell me, I really liked that line about the arses. I was like, oh, thank you. They were trying to get me to cut it out. So, yeah, it's it's very individual, I think, yeah. Um, so obviously it's been a while now since Phosphorescence came out and, and you've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people who have read the book. Um, have you met people who have taken the advice uh, that you have in Phosphorescence and what impact has it had on their lives? Yeah. People have written like really beautiful stories to me about um, struggling with illness or struggling with disability or with chronic pain or with grief and how they've held on to certain bits, whether it's like letting tiny drops, drops of stillness falling through your day. And, and I think really primarily paying attention. 
Um, people have told me they've gone on all walks and, and one woman who struggled to walk for a very long time was telling me about how she's just every day going an extra five metres in her local park and how she may, hopes to make it the whole way around and what that's meant to her to see it in its kind of different variations, different temperatures, different... Um, so, yeah, I think, I think probably that's the biggest thing is to be conscious that it's not just like um, icing on on a cake it's just not just like you know the natural world is around us and oh that's cool when you see some, when you see I don't know a double rainbow which is a miracle <laughs> but to go just make yourself do it because it lifts you and dwarfs you in a way that's very psychologically healthy I think. Mm. Um, and with these discussions that you that you've had you know with, with people who have spoken to you about the book and you know during your marketing tour for it and, and everything um, have you had any conversations that you wish you'd had prior to publication? Um, I think like it's, it's been so rich on the on the question of awe and of wonder. I think one thing that got me thinking was because there's there's so many different ways in which we all feel awe. Like um, it's not prescribed. It is what you know gives you goosebumps. So that's how scientists measure awe now in goosebumps. Um, it's probably not the perfect measurement, but it's an interesting one. And I realised when I did um, Zan Rose Take 5 and I was combing through, like, all of my music library and listening to it loud and trying to work out how would I have just five phosphorescent songs and what would they be? I was like, oh, this is a huge thing. I didn't, I didn't write about in the book, like the power of music and of song and of choral um, music as well. Like we saw it, like that was that was erupting globally, um, and we only saw it in snippets on YouTube and various things on social media. But um, I think that would have been a great thing to to explore, and maybe I will. But that is one of the most dominant ways I think people can experience. Or uh, what are what are some phosphorescent songs? <laughs> I can tell you my take five. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did the Triffids and that was Wide Open Road, just that sense of space and possibility and travel, which is blah, like how much would you like to do that now to have that kind of possibility? Mm. Um, I'm going to forget all of them now. I wanted to have Blondie and I couldn't include it. I ended with um, what the One Perfect Day by Elbow. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Which was, um, which was, it's about all about like, just this is a mo this is a perfect moment on a perfect day, and the sun's coming in the curtains, and throw your arms out wide and like savor it. That you'll never have this moment again, and how what a glorious moment it is. I loved that. I also did PJ Harvey. This is love. Yeah. Um, when she says, you know. Why do I feel, you know, why do you say like, life's so complex when I just want to sit here and watch you undress? That's a great line. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. It's like overthinking everything and analysing everything and she's there's something so kind of raw and pure and I also love her in the video for that when she's in that white suit with like the um, fringe off, off her arms. and Yeah, there are loads of phosphorescent so whatever makes you get up and dance and... Um, and whatever makes you think, and it's that that song that you put on when you're on a road trip and you're in the car, and it feels like the horizon stretches wider than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say um, hello to anybody who's who's just tuned in. Uh, we are talking with Julia Baird about phosphorescence, and if you in the audience have any questions for Julia, please do drop them into the comments, and we will do our best to get to them. Um, so my next question is, uh, you started writing phosphorescence in a very difficult place uh, with the struggles that you're having with, with your health. Um, when you started, did you have a clear idea of what phosphorescence was going to be or did it wind up taking you to a place that you didn't expect? Um, it's weird because it was like, um, I always think of like, one of those blind, what are those blind moles or something? You're feeling your way, like you know that you've got to say something. I knew I had to say something and it, or, or like a subterranean fungus or something and I just had to sit and write and sit and write and I just remember the day that I worked out that what it was, that the, the word when the word phosphorescence came to me and I, because I didn't want it to be twee and I didn't want it to be about, oh, recipes for happiness. It's not that. 
it's it's when life is so rough and you feel that you've got nothing and you feel that you can't put one, one foot in front of the other and you kind of don't want to like um how do you go on and where do you meet and also what is that reservoir inside you that you can f fill and also kind of you know um live on when life is like that so that that to me suddenly made me realize what it was i was going to it was actually it, it all coalesced around the word like how is it that we stay alive and you know we've all met people who are like that too who somehow managed to radiate that goodness or calm or capacity for joy um and i think that i think that you can i, I don't think that's just innate I think that you can open yourself up to being that, being that person, yeah. So when, when you started writing, uh, were you writing for yourself or were you writing because you wanted to, to bring a book to an, to an audience? Um, I wanted to get it down. I just wanted to get this down. So I, I was writing for myself and I was writing for my kids. And... Um, I never, I, I wasn't even thinking, it, I mean, I'm, I'm delighted, I'm so delighted. Like I cannot tell you as a writer, when people write to you and say, this is a book that comforted me when I needed comfort, like there's no greater thing that you could want your words to be used for, right? Like it just, it, that makes me very happy. I really wasn't anticipating that it would, um, you know, like by so many people would, would feel that or, or say that to me. So. Yeah, I, I I was writing for you know kindred spirits about our basic shared humanity, and um, stories about you know staying alive. So yeah, I honestly was not ever like, oh, I really think there's a market, you know, gap in the market for my thoughts on you know fireflies and glowworms and mm -hmm. bioluminescent squid. You know, <laughs> I didn't think, I didn't think, and and assure me because I tried to pitch that to. Um, I've, as I've said, Catherine Milne here, like from HarperCollins, immediately got it and understood. But I tell you, there were other publishers who, who in other places, who did not, who were like, no, I just don't think that's a thing. And so I just wrote it from my heart. I wrote it because I had to. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds corny, but it's really true. It was, yeah, just came out. I mean, look, I, you know, we talk to a lot of authors here, and I think that's actually a common thing with with really successful books is people who wrote it for themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because you have to. Yeah. 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 Um, so, if you hadn't written phosphorescence and you were to start writing it today, yeah, would the same book come out, or would it be completely different? Oh, like if I hadn't written it. Yeah. Um, I think it would be basically the same. I mean, it's so hard thinking of a world post-COVID, right? Um, yes. It's kind of been shaping everything. Obviously, I'd have my chapter on music and that would really bring the whole thing together. Um, I think it would fundamentally be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, speaking of music, I, I was talking to somebody recently uh, who had created an entire playlist uh, for people to, to listen to while, while, she, uh, uh, while you read her book. So maybe that's yes. something that you could that, that you could look at. Yeah, it was sweet. One of my friends put together a playlist because they were going to put together some music to put at my launch, and obviously I didn't have it, so they just gave it to me. Everyone had to nominate their phosphorescent song. I should do that actually. Yeah. So finding a light in dark places has taken on an almost entirely new dimension, given where people find themselves now, uh, with the impact of COVID and lockdowns and just. 2020 in general what's advice that you would give to people who are struggling right now to kind of find their way back to a place of, of light a big question i'm sorry to put you on the spot <laughs> no 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 it's not a big question i mean i i, I pause because I, I really try very carefully in the book not to say oh these are answers for everyone mm -hmm. and this is the panacea and it's just a really simple formula you do this this and this it's more a sense of, um, and 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 it's more a sense of. I, I spoke about what worked for me, right? And and I, when every when all the lights go out, I have to go really really still, like commotion and noise and all those things. Really, kind of, I just find very distracting. So, and 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 not panicking. And um, again, 
Like it, that sense of, um, I write about that um, James Stockdale, who's a, a pilot who was in Vietnam and he was shot down and he was tortured really badly at the Hanoi Hilton and um, he lasted for years, but, you know, he came back physically. They had almost destroyed him. And they asked him afterwards, how did you make it? And he said, you have to have, you have to be acutely conscious of the seriousness of your situation, but hope that you will prevail. So it's not like, oh, everything's fine or don't worry, everyone gets a, you know, I don't know, cancer diagnosis or loses a leg or like whatever every day and like there's, let's look on the bright side of life. It is not that. That is horrible. It is a horrible thing to happen. It's a horrible thing to happen to someone that you love or someone that you know and it can be devastating. Um, but you can also hope that you can prevail and you can also um, find ways of, of working out what it is that makes you strong. Mm-hmm. And and I just think there's so much research now on green plate, green spaces and on the natural world. So whatever it is, the corner of the natural world that makes you feel happiest and most at home, like carve that out like it's a necessity, like that's a meal to have but whenever you can because I think once you get into habits of doing that or walking outside or like it, it, it will provide strength in a way that you didn't even know that was kind that's kind of surprising um and I don't think it's a trivial thing I think that's almost like the wisdom of the ancients is is in all of that what it means to to um yeah to get outside and to be still or you know dance in the middle of the desert and be noisy or dance in your bedroom or you know um just to think about it and to keep yourself open to that, open to the possibility, open mm. to those kinds of possibilities. I think that's it. I think it's paying attention to the world. And, like, I, and I often felt like going through my really black times, it's like at the end of today I'm still going to be in a really crap position and I'm going to feel horrible and I'm still going to be in pain and all the rest of it. But if I focus on someone else for today, then maybe I will have done something for them. Maybe I will have, like, and... And that was how that kind of got me through quite a lot, like paying attention to the world outside yourself. I think um, can be a really can be a strengthening thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a lot of people are dealing with returning to, to I guess, a sense of an interrupted life. Uh, normal changed for everybody over the past twelve months. Um, and now it's changing again as some restrictions ease up um, and others don't, obviously. Um, but how do you fight the darkness when what is stable is just changing so much and so rapidly? Yeah. Um, again, there's no pat or trite answers to that. Um, you know, it, it it's... Things can change in an instant. The floor can, one of my friends came over today and was telling me about the how a relationship suddenly dissolved in a really shocking way and he was saying to me, you know when that the floor falls out from underneath you just in an instant and it can in an instant. Um, it's very hard to cushion yourself from that but I, I guess I would say, it, you know, like like many others have said over this time, it's a bit like... The idea of prioritize of prioritizing your own mental health and being gentle with yourself um, is really really important right now because I think people are struggling in ways that we don't even necessarily identify and we keep beating ourselves up for wanting to get back and move over it and go past it and you know um, I think I think that's I think that's that's really all I can say um, with with the sense of stability or not. So I'm. Um, we're we're going to wrap up our questions very shortly, um, and I just wanted to throw it over to the to the audience um, as to uh, some questions that they might want to ask. I see so far that we have a lot of very very positive comments, but we're lacking questions. So uh, if there are members of the audience who have uh, burning questions that they would like Julia Baird to answer for them, uh, please drop them in the comments because we will be wrapping up soon. Uh, so can you tell us a couple of books that you would recommend for people who have read Phosphorescence and kind of want to dive in a bit deeper? Yep. I loved, oh, there's heaps of books on forest therapy um, uh, and Japanese philosophy, which I think is just, we have so much to learn from. Um, 
There's a wonderful book called The Sound of, I think it's called The Sound of a Snail Eating or it might be The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating, which emphasise what I'm talking about. It's the most gorgeous thing. I, it's, it's a woman who's very, very ill who a friend gave her a, a plant just next to her bed and she couldn't leave her bed for like, I don't know, a couple of years or something and there was a snail on it and she just watched this snail every day. And then they got a bigger tank for it and then she watched it and then suddenly there were babies and she wrote this beautiful thing about learning about its teeth and about its habits and you can see all through it all how much that actually sustained her. Robert McFarlane writes really beautiful nature stuff. Um, in terms of the faith things, I think Nadia Boltz Weber, who I write about, and Joan Chittister, who's a Benedictine nun, I love her calls to stillness. Um, and um, Miriam Rose... Ongame Bauman, who was the senior Australian of the year, has got meditations on Dadiri and um, the, yeah, and Dadiri and, and, and as a First Nations elder, I think. I'm so pleased to see that she's a senior Australian of the year because I think she's got a lot to tell us. I mean, so much of what I was writing about, as I say in the book, just comes back to that ancient wisdom in terms of listening to country. Um, and being still and respecting the land. And, yeah, so um, I would read as much as I could by Indigenous authors. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask a, a very Booktopia question. Um, yes. Are there any books that, you know, are coming out this year that you're excited to read? Oh, I thought you were going to say that I had already read. I mean, you can, you can, you can answer that too. Oh, yeah, I've been reading so much fiction lately, um, but I only just read Pachinko, which I loved, and The Where the Crawdads Sing, which I also mm. loved. I've just been, I've, I've, and I'm reading A Vegetarian now, which is a wild ride. Um, and uh, Sally Rooney's got her new book out, um, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. Oh, gosh, there's so many books. I can't even think of them now. Let me keep thinking. We're all very excited about Sally Rooney at Booktopia. I know, right? When that I news know. drops, oh, my God, The Office was great. Yeah, it's going to be great. Exactly. Um, well, speaking of new books, uh, rumour has it that you have a new book uh, in the works. Yes. Is there anything that you can tell us? Um, I can only say it's, I mean, it's about grace and um, this is something I touched on a little bit in Phosphorescence, just which is something that we so rarely see in on the public stage or especially in the political realm when it comes to giving people a second chance, um, forgiving someone who doesn't deserve it. Um, you know, it seems in some ways countercultural and I want to get into the nitty gritty of it because I don't think it's easy. I don't think it comes from waving a handkerchief in someone's direction. I think it's a very hard um a very hard thing to do for, for a lot of people. So, yeah, I'm just kind of fascinated by it and ha how it changes people's lives when you you yourself act that way or when you, you know, receive that, that kind of, um, you know, grace. And, yeah, we see it in restorative justice. We see it in, um, you know, in civil rights movements. So, yeah, I, I, there's many ways I want to I want to dig into it. Fantastic. Yeah. Um do you any any hints on when it could be ready? Oh, I think it's supposed to be out. Um, sorry, my publisher will probably text me. It's um, it's wait a minute. I'm supposed to have it at the end of this year. In I think it's meant to be out at the end of the following year, 2022. Cool, yeah. exciting, something to look forward to. <laughs> um, all right, we we have some some great yeah. questions coming through uh, on the audience feed. Uh, yeah. So this question comes from Robin. Uh, she yeah. asked, do you think that we let our children down by shutting down instinctual talent for touching delight? Yeah, I do. Um, I really would recommend everyone read this. I haven't got it in my room, like every other book on earth. Oh, but did I say I would just get a text from my from my book? <laughs> is, is that it? <laughs> 22. <laughs> oh, I got that right. Anyway, um, so, um, yeah, I think, I think we do. I think that... Um, we, yeah, I mean, um, Rachel Carson talks about how it, the battle for wonder she thinks is won or lost in childhood, and look, I think that we revive it, and I think that we remember. But to 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 think about it as a habit, Martha Nussbaum, the American philosopher, writes about um, "Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star," and how wonderful that is, even as a framework to get a kid to wonder about a star 
Some of my favourite people, oh, that would be another chapter. Here we go, another conversation. Oh, no, I did. I did the overview effect. But I think even if you don't go out into space like an astronaut, some of my favourite people are astronomers. Um, I love having those scientists on the drum because they get so excited and they gesticulate wildly and there's so much they don't know and they do know and um, they, yeah, and they are asking really fundamental questions about why we're here as well as the perennial um, aliens and so on. So, yeah, I think we, um, I think we as parents, it's need to think about what Rachel Carson did with her four-year-old nephew, Roger, when she just took him by the hand and they would wander through the woods. And at night they um, went down to rock pools and to see, and I keep meaning to do that actually, because I've never actually gone with a torch and looked at like what what was the nighttime activity in a rock pool. Yeah. Um, and I, I've, I, it's hard to drag kids out to kind of do some of that stuff. But I think I was telling you before that on the last day I could touch my book when it got when they literally wrench, wrench it from your hands and say you cannot like forget you're obsessing. Like, what does Helen Garner say? You don't finish a book, you just walk away from it. Mm-hmm or they wrench it from your hand. So it was on that day, I couldn't touch it anymore. I was down the South Coast and I heard there was phosphorescence at the next beach. And so I took the kids after dinner that night and they'd always been a bit like, meh, you know, mum gets up at 5 a.m. to try to look for it and she comes back wet and then talking about stuff, but I'm not that interested. And when we walked and saw this like neon blue curling wave and they ran down the beach, they were just running around like puppies. They were lit up, we were all sparkling. We left these sparkling footprints and like, experiencing that with your kids is like is so great and now they keep going oh can we go back to that beach and i'm like no that's the magic of it you you never know when it's actually going to happen so yes robin i do i think it's not so much about letting our children down i think it's like the best thing we can do for our kids is to take them to places where they of awe and wonder uh so here's here's a great question um what came first the concepts in the book working for you in your life or swimming in darkness and exposure to nature? Or did you stumble on the research and then try those things out? Mm, good question. Who's that from? That is from Joel. Oh, hi, Joel. Um, so, oh, yeah, he's, I think Joel just put up the Robert McFarlane book. Exactly. Um, yes. yep. Underland. Uh, so that's, you know why that's a really good question is because it was when an editor, my editor at the New York Times said, oh, um, can you write something on swimming? Um we're opening up our bureau in Australia. I'd really like a piece on swimming from you. I see you swim all the time. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm like, what am I going to say? In a column, you're supposed to have some kind of argument or like, you know, whatever. So I was just thinking, and I was like, what? I just kept thinking, what is it? What is it? Why do I feel so amazing when I do that? And that's when I stumbled on, the, I started thinking about the awe and stumbled on this body of research, which is being built. And, um, and was like, there really is something to this. There really is orc, hunt, hunting orc can make us strong. And it built from all that. I pulled in other things I've been thinking about, other ideas I've been playing with, but it, it all built from, yeah, swimming and awe. Uh, so we've got a question from Claudine. Um, Claudine asks, will you write a follow-up book to Phosphorescence, which I, sh- I assume would be Phosphorescence 2? Mm. Um, phosphorescence, the music, the music. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, well, in a way, Grace kind of is. Um, I would think about it after. Fin- oh, because the Grace book is called Bright Shining. So I, I don't know. I would think about it after that. Mm. Um, yeah, I would think about it. Uh, Mac asks, uh, what are you reading now? And what is your most memorable read? The one book that's really stuck with you? Oh my gosh, in like my whole life? Oh, that's just wow. As a book Um, person, it's very hard to choose one. (laughs) I can't. Like, I used to, I I always thought, like, like like a lot of the books I read when I was backpacking around Europe when I was 18 and 19, I I was reading Somerset Maugham and Alice Walker and also biographies. I read a biography of um, Oscar Wilde that I absolutely loved. Um, that Richard Elliman book. But right now I'm on an absolute bender for fiction. I've got, I've put, <laughs> I've put a bath in my bathroom and that has changed my life. And so I'm just pounding through all this <laughs> fiction in the bath. So I read Sally Rooney and I read Meg Mason and Pachinko and Vegetarian. I'm getting on to Girl, Woman, Other next. So um, 
In terms of Helen Garner books had a big impact on me, Charmian Clift, um, and I loved that biography of her as well. It's always shifting. I don't think you can limit it to just one single book. A lot of poetry as well. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the next question uh, is from Miz, and Miz asks, she says, I've, I've never swum in luminescent water. What yeah. is the experience like, and did it give you new insights and feelings? Yeah, it did. It gave me like, okay, so the other day um, someone was telling me they live over Cabbage Tree Bay where you can see it occasionally and um, rarely, and he said, I just woke up in the middle of the night and there was just this squealing, like, and I was like, what on earth is going on? And it was just that, that silly excitement. You know when you can't contain yourself and you're like, oh, my God, like the double rainbow guy who's, like, so excited. And it's just, like, um, it's so beautiful and delicious and also playful. Like, so it's not just something you sit and look at. You're diving into it. You're scooping it up. You are working out different ways to... Do it. I mean, I wasn't, we weren't diving under when we we're at the south coast until I was like, oh yeah, the sharks would be lit up. So we don't have to worry about the sharks because they would be glowing as they came towards us. Yeah. Um, it's the playfulness of it, I think that is, and the unpredictability that is completely gorgeous. So new thoughts and feelings. It just gives you this really crazy, beautiful high. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I think um I think that's a that's a lovely kind of note to end it on. It looks like we've uh We've reached the end of our of our questions from from the community. So thank you everybody who uh, tuned in to watch and who asked a question. And Julia, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us this evening. You're so welcome. And you know I'm going to keep thinking like one book. I'm going to put it on your Booktopia page. I'll come back to the feed if I think of one book. But then I'll just be on there like every ten minutes, and you'll be like, it's okay. We don't do it anymore. <laughs> Look, we would welcome that. We, we, we'd love to have you on that. Um, I'm sharing all your books. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.